with Pals. I'm Pals Chicho, and today I'm sitting here with Rob Gauthier, aka the ET Whisperer. Rob's a metaphysical speaker and a known channeler. He's been featured on countless panels, shows, workshops, and he's hosted countless more. He's the host of the Enlightenment Evolution Hour, which is on the Evolution Enlightenment Network, and uh, you'll be seeing that coming out soon. And uh, Rob, thanks for beaming in, brother. It's great to have you, man. I've been trying to run you down for a long time. Um, I'm happy to be here, and I'm I'm glad it lined up to where it worked. I I've uh, been so so crazy with family and, and work and stuff. I never see my mess. I had to reroute them all to my wife, and she doesn't like me for that sometimes in the in the heat of it because she gets all the uh, extra messages. But I'm I'm glad we connected. I've known you for a long time. I've always loved you, and I appreciate everything that you do too. So. Thanks, brother. Thanks, man. Um, that means a lot to me. And uh, yeah, I've been excited about about this one for a while. So awesome to have you. Tell your wife I said thank you. I have to do the same for mine because she's like, what do you mean you have a podcast on a Saturday <laughs> when you're supposed to be helping me? With I'm like, uh, we have to schedule around this one, you know, but um, yeah, man. So, you know, for people who don't who don't know your background, um, can you want to walk, give us a quick walkthrough of, of, you know, how you went from a, a pretty dark place um, to, you know, a much, a much brighter place? Yeah, it's a, it's a big story. Uh, the compressed version is I, I got into a lot of trouble when I was a kid. Uh, that calmed down when I had my son uh, when I was 19 years old. He was born with some severe special needs uh, cerebral palsy. And by the time he hit one and a half to two years old, uh, myself and his mother found out the extent of what that was going to look like. Um, you know, not being able to walk, talk, um, and, and a lot of other things, which sent me down a pretty dark place too emotionally. Um, during that time, I got into a car accident uh, and got prescribed pain meds, and that led into a huge uh, several year drug addiction. Um, after the doctors kicked me off, uh, I went to the streets and when you go to the streets to buy pain medicine, every other kind of drug is there. And if you can't get what you want, then you get what you can get. And, uh, so I ended up going into a lot of different kinds of drugs and, and stayed there for a long time. After, uh, all of that ran its course and I finally decided to get clean. Um, I started having emotions, thoughts, uh, things that I hadn't experienced since I was a very young man, you know, um, having my son at 19 and, and starting in drugs when 21, 22, uh, it was pretty intense. So I had to re go through all of this stuff that I'd gone through earlier, uh, that I suppressed with the drugs emotionally and mentally. And finally, um, I started having real, real spiritual experiences just by walking outside and breathing air and looking at the trees, the sunsets, you know, petting my dog. It started becoming like, this is a real beautiful and great thing. Um, it led me to start looking for that thing, you know, the thing that's behind the beauty. Um, I used to go to church when I was a kid. My family is still to this day, very Christian, uh, hardcore into the Christianity. I mean, they're not hardcore. They don't go to church every, every week and yell at sinners, but I mean, they still very uh, devout in their belief. So I couldn't go back down that road. I had already eaten up all of that uh, experience by asking the pastor all the questions and when they couldn't answer or gave me an answer that didn't feel right, I just said, I'm not gonna redo that. Um, so I looked for something that was similar. And when I was younger, my friend and I had some interest in uh, lots of stuff like UFOs and ghosts, uh, Bigfoot, paranormal activity. Um, so I was like, you know, if there is something that's past what we are as humans, how would we find out? I did research and I found a place that kind of mixed a little bit of Christianity with a lot of uh, new age metaphysics. And basically there are a group of psychics uh, in the church called um, spiritualist or spiritualism churches. And they said, hey, we can prove God exists because we can connect to dead people and tell you what they're experiencing. And I was like, well, I believe in ghosts. I believe that you don't, you know, when you die, that there's something else. So I tried it and I went fully skeptical uh, and it had sounds my... sounds like the plot of a comic book that I read recently. <laughs> like, it's, like it's, pretty, it's pretty cool. It's crazy, but it's cool. Really? That's great. Yeah, it sounds just like the plot of a, of a comic book I read. Like, 
you know, they yeah. go in and then there, and then it goes, of course, it spirals into mayhem and super powered chaos. But yeah, keep going. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, I'd like to know which one that is, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get the title for you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, so I go to this place and the guy goes, you know, um, this, this is before I'm on Facebook, uh, social media wasn't really a thing. I mean, it was, but I wasn't playing a uh, part of it yet. And he says, you know, uh, family members who have illnesses, child, la la la, all of these things, uh, that landed with my son and, and some of my other family members. And then told me about stuff that I didn't even know about my family, like multiple generations back. When I told my dad uh, what was said there, he actually was pretty surprised because he, he was the guy who did our family tree and the genealogy. Um, that was one of his big interests. So he told me a story about several generations back exactly what this guy had said. So I was like, wow, this is great. And I went for a while. And after about the third or fourth time, the guy uh, who I started, who I sat next to the first day, who I got started to know, um, I said, man, this is so great. I really wish I could do this. And he said, everyone can do it. And I'm like, nah, -uh. <laughs> you know, not everybody can just talk to that. He said, everyone can do it. Why don't you stay after? We always have meetings here. We do meditations. Stay after and we'll, we'll talk about some stuff. So I did and did a meditation. And the first time I did a meditation, it was amazing. We saw um, plasma like the uh, spiritualism churches are big on plasma. Mm -hmm. uh, in the center of the room, there was a purple energy and it looked like it was just floating gas and it was really cool. So so did everybody yeah. see this? Everybody saw it? Uh, some people saw it, some people didn't. Say, um, yeah. yeah, some some people, uh, the first time I only saw the outline and the color of it, but the more I went, the, the more I could see it mm -hmm. whenever something did come through. Um, so after a while, uh, I started meditating and learning and they started teaching techniques. They had all sorts of guest speakers come, uh, you know, shamans and, uh, now what I know is channeling back then I didn't understand it was channeling. Um, but it was basically a church focused around mediumship. So mm -hmm. that's where I started my meditation. Um, uh, eventually because it's organized religion and I never really meshed with those. And I started seeing the dogma, that was there. I saw the infighting of the people, uh, groups who couldn't agree on incarnation or not reincarnation. Yeah. I'm like, for a religion, you guys should know if, if this is a thing or not, especially if you're talking. You should about at it. least have a rule about it, right? I mean, right. You would think. Mm -hmm. And no, they didn't. So I just I, I backed out and I started doing my own work. Eventually, I get to the uh, place where I find a uh, gateway experience, which is Hemi Sink uh, from right. the Monroe Institute. And that's what really set me off. And after months of doing that, uh, one time I just went beyond the level that I'd normally gone to. And that's where I first met the entity who I now channel and who's been working with me for a long time called Treb. That's right. Uh, so so before, we, before we keep going, so the Monroe Institute has, yeah. a, um, they have a, a, a series of CDs called the Gateway Experience. Um, and it's a course. It's a six CD course, um, I believe. I, I haven't made it to the six CD yet, but um, in general, it's it it opens you up in, in kind of every way. Um, and it's a, it's a lot, there's a lot of techniques um, to learn. And Rob, I I think you were probably of everyone I've ever known to do this course. You were the most diligent and dedicated to it. Um, and and it I mean it certainly brought you experiences I don't think you could have imagined were possible. It took me about four months to do the whole series, but you're right. I did it every day. I did it three times a day. And when I wasn't doing that, I was doing my own technique, uh, just closing my eyes. Like we're sitting here talking. I listen. I can hear you know the fan in the background. I can hear the people in the parking lot. I can hear your microphone. You know all those things and just absorbing life that way. So between the 45 minutes to an hour to an hour and a half of each of those three meditations, plus closing my eyes three, four, five, six hours in a day, pretty much 90% of my waking time was dedicated to growing my consciousness. And I didn't know that's what I was doing there. I just knew that it was helping me feel better, mm -hmm. um, behave better and be a better person. So that's all I needed to know. I was like, these are the yeah. things I want in my life. And I continued and um, 
using that was the huge, huge, huge thing. The Monroe Institute people, um, Robert Monroe, uh, one of the greatest things because that's that's what they wanted. They wanted to teach people mm -hmm. consciousness involved in, in evolution of consciousness. And for me, it worked. I know people who've used it, who've uh, increased their meditation ability, mm -hmm. some that have helped relax, some that have broken through in their intuition and psychic ability. Mm -hmm. um, so everyone who's used it, the least I've heard is that they can meditate better now. Uh, so at least it's good for from that level forward. So, so the, 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 the CDs culminate um, and, and each, you know, they this I think they were recorded in the 50s. Right, Rob? It's like and you, you hear the voice and it's and it has that kind of like that 50s tone to it. Um, and, and everything was called, you know, the step. So there was 20 there. There was 21 steps. Right, Rob? Is that how it went? Uh, there was uh, seven waves and six iter or uh, six waves and then another wave that was added after so initially there were six waves four iterations of each and they went incrementally but yeah uh, uh, 21 steps was the last uh cd or the last part of it to use and each time you would go up in different uh numbered iterations so you start off with the 10 step and then you go to the 12 step right. and then yeah so it continuously went up to 21. So what did you do when you got to 21? <laughs> well, when I first did, I was like, great, you know, that's great. And I used it for a couple of months. And the night that I met Trev, I was like, you know what? Uh, I need to go deeper. <laughs> I'm already like completely in the half a zone. Um, you know, sometimes even my auditory senses were shut down to the world around me. So when I was meditating, I was getting deep enough where I couldn't hear the TV or the dogs or, or the kid. And I was like, I need to go deeper. So I was like, well, what's beyond 21, 22? What's after that? You know, I was like, how about just beyond 21? Just, yeah. and it wasn't even an intentional thing. It was just like, I get up to 21 and I knew I wanted to go further. And I just said beyond, you know, mm -hmm. boom, beyond 21. So what happened when, when you went beyond? When you went beyond? <laughs> well, that's where I instantly felt this sensation. And it was something that I'd never felt before only thing that ever came close was a few dream states and one time i had a past life recollection during the day while i was awake so these are the only two things that are uh, comparable and even that we're talking lower lower bottom percentage um i'm instantly in a place i'd never been i i'm i know that it's not physically real to the reality that i'm in my body in all the time you can't make the distinction between physical reality and astral reality, except for the things that you know are different, like small sensory differences, heightened sensory, heightened color. Uh, you know, like for me, what's funny, I tell people when I'm at, in my astral state, I, I never smell. It's like one of my senses are always gone and most of the time it's smell. So I can smell sometimes when I'm doing it, but a lot of the time I can't. Um, but anyway, sorry, I'm jumping up. Uh, so I'm instantly sitting in this place and it looks like, uh, <laughs> the best way to describe it, it looks like something futuristic <laughs> and I know it sounds corny, but it's like metallic, uh, it's shiny. There are little uh, holographic things all over the place. Um, and I'm trying to figure out what is going on here. And there's this sign and it's just written in this really weird language and I'm looking at it and I, I can't figure out what it is, but I know it's important. I know it's there for whoever is, is there with me. And I'm sitting in this place that no one's around, nothing's moving, but I know the sign is there for whoever's supposed to be there. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking and I'm like, what does this mean? And the longer I stare and the longer I focus, the more I'm able to see it. And it looks like in English, something to the equivalent of, please sit here and wait. Someone will be with you soon. Like you're at a McDonald's line, yeah. right? <laughs> Someone will be with you shortly. You. Yeah. And all of a sudden, um, open the door and there is quite a bit of light behind the door. And as it's coming up, it feels like it's in slow motion. But when it's coming up, I see these incredibly gigantic legs. I couldn't see anything in detail because the light behind it uh, so first, it just appears like a shadow, but a really long, tall, wide shadow. And then I meet Treb, and Treb comes into that room. 
and imagine meeting some entity that's like an extraterrestrial or imagine meeting some kind of spirit, something like that. Okay, now imagine that it's a reptilian with teeth as, as sharp as razors and about seven and a half foot tall. And that was my experience, gigantic eyes just looking at me. Uh, I mean, his eyes like that big each, that's wow. how it felt. Yeah, and I'm like, holy God. And instantly I freeze, my whole body feels, not my body body, but my body there mm. felt like it was just frozen. Anyone knows that panic. If you've ever been in a car accident uh, where you know you're gonna hit something and you have no way to stop it, mm -hmm. or if uh, a wild animal's running at you, some of you might've had that experience out in the woods, that's how it felt, but a hundred times more. And instantly, like as I'm feeling this in slow motion, almost feeling a heaval of energy, I just felt this sense and it shut all my fear down. Hmm. This sense was a sense of love. And I try to elaborate the best way I can. At that point in my life, the, the only human being I ever dared to love more than myself was my son. Uh, even through the drug issues, all the things that I'd ever gone through, even though I, I disconnected with 90% of the world, my son was like the most important thing. I always cared for him, always spent time with him, always did for him. And all of a sudden, this love that I feel for him is just this huge thing that I've always been able to, to tell other people, hey, my, my son is the most important thing. That level of love that I felt for my son was being shoved to me, but at a, it made the love that I feel for my son feel like it was small and insignificant. That's the only way I could explain it. Wow. It was a sense of so love big. that I never felt before. Yeah. So it was, it was a, it was big, it was big. It was a big feeling. It was kind of a, but yet you were still looking at, you were, you were still looking at Treb, right? This, this thing you that you just described, right? Yeah. And, and I knew that's the only place that that could be coming from me and him are here by ourselves yeah. and I'm in this place of nowhere. And I'm like, why does this thing love me so much? You know, why does this thing care about me enough um, where I can feel that? And I've never been able, you know, I could instinctively look at someone and see if they're pissed off or if they're mm -hmm. happy or if they're excited, but never felt another person or another being's emotions. Right. So that moment was, it, it just, it changed me for one, but secondly, it stopped me dead in my tracks. No more fear, no anything. And I'm like, what is going on? You know, who are you? What mm -hmm. is going on? And, you know, hey, I'm connected to you. We're related in, in my own language at that time, like new age words, I call them, or spiritual words. I didn't have that vocabulary. So I'm yeah. like, what's going on? We're connected. We're connected in a lot of different ways. And I'm here to connect with any time that you want. If you ever want to know more, if you ever want to communicate, come back and we can do this. And it so, was short. It was short and sweet. But that's, that's the amount to it. Um, he says, the reality that you understand and know isn't quite the way you think. And I'll share whatever I can with you if you want to know. Wow. That was it. So... I mean, you, I mean, they, a lot of people talk about how when you ask to project or, you know, it, in a dream state or, you, you know, the moment fear becomes too constricting that, you know, we, we're kind of like right back in our, in our bodies, you know, like, um, you hear, you hear people talk about, you know, sometimes there's, there's a moment in a meditation or, you know, and I, I have a sense of this having experience with DMT and all that, but you know, it's like you can either close off or you can surrender, you know? Um, and, and, and I always think of like the, like the moment you just described, like what, what kept you from just kind of blasting back into your body? Um, I mean, I guess this feeling of love you're saying is what, but I mean, were you, you, you freaked out? I mean, like you had to have been freaked out. Like I'm what? Yeah. Well, I never thought that I would be out hanging. I mean, I heard the Hemi Singh talk about out of body experience. I've had one of my own past life. 
so all of these things, but I never anticipated being able to leave my body and communicate with someone in a direct way with me having control of that. I thought maybe I might get another past life, or maybe I might get some form of hallucination from self-induced whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought there was a lot of possibilities. That was not one of them. I, I tried to keep open to the possibilities, but I still really had my beliefs that, that it was right. going to just enhance my meditation and maybe give me a cool experience or two. <laughs> this wasn't, this wasn't up on top of your top five. Cool. Like your idea of a cool experience. Um, I mean, who it's at first, not really. Cause it, even though I, I was calmed at that moment until I came back fully into my body, the moment I came back into my body, I was like, I think I broke my brain. I think these meditations mess my my neurological system up. That's what I honestly thought. I mean, and you know what? That's what I would think, too. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I think that I'd probably be, like, afraid to tell anyone. I, I mean, like, but, you know, I I know that you, that you, you were freaked out. You were pretty freaked out and that you you didn't um you know it, it, it wasn't an immediate return to try to re reestablish contact that there was some trepidation on your part and uh you know i just think like i heard you talking to our our friend my uh, reuben you know and i and i remember i remember you saying and i don't think you had ever shared this with anyone before you told them and I, it just stuck with me because it was so human of you to share it and uh that that you know you were like honestly you 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 went to the emergency room afterwards didn't you i mean like to just to get checked out like yeah just, just to, <laughs> and like dude i feel like there's like I, mo a lot of people would do the same thing you know what happened what did the doctor say uh i told him what was going on um i i said i don't know you know because in my family even though now i understand my family had a lot of psychic people who didn't the religious programming right. went against that. So they believe themselves to be crazy. Or I said, there are some members in my family's history that have mental illness, la la la. Yeah. I, I, you know, did the meditation break my brain? Did it set <laughs> off some schizophrenic paranoia? Yeah. Um, and he said, you know, it probably is just meditations. He said, it doesn't sound, he said, yeah, it sounds crazy. But when you're dealing with meditations that are using sound and changing the waves of your brain, this will happen. He said, stop using the meditation. Yeah. And if it doesn't happen again, then we'll know. But if it is, then come back. We'll, we'll get yeah. you set up with a doctor that you need. But he said, I wouldn't worry about it now. He said, there's a lot of people who experience meditation and very uh, weird things in meditation. Yeah. He said, you know, you're, you're playing around with this stuff and you've never done that your whole life. You know, yeah. it's, it, it opens up different things. So it's like, all right, well, so, trust the doctor. It was so, I think, brave of you and, and cool of you to, to share that, you know, with people, even though it's like, I mean, it just, it speaks to your humanity, man, that you're, you know, you well, want to do that. You know, to be honest, I, I, when I, when I kind of went into the, the plan to learn how to channel and then share it publicly, I try telling myself, you know, I should be able to talk about anything because yeah. if I'm already talking to other people who have no clue who I am, that I'm talking to aliens, I should be able to talk about anything. <laughs> and um, at first I was very, very open when I first started sharing on YouTube with everything like um, yeah, intensely. So, and then later I met someone who was working on a project with me the first person who ever reached out to me and they said, you know, hey, uh, you know, sharing is good, but sharing too much. You know, do you want people to miss out on this material? Because uh, people come on and you're on camera without your shirt. Because I always used to channel shirtless on yeah. camera, but, you know, from a shoulder. They say they probably, you know, think you're crazy already. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, stuff like that. So I was like, you know, maybe he's got a point. So I pulled back for a couple of years. Yeah. And then I started sharing more because the part, <clears throat> the part of the whole experience that that's important is the human stuff around what happens with the channel. That's why I get so frustrated at the greater community 
I see a lot of uh, people who are in positions of spiritual teaching, channeling. Um, they tell everyone how perfect that they are out there. And some of these people I know personally, and some of them, um, I know enough about them. It's like, you're a human, you're living on earth. And no matter how much you want to be perfect, none of us are perfect. Yeah. You know, we might be perfect for ourselves, but someone else is not going to think you're perfect. You're yeah. doing things that other people won't see as perfect. So we're, we're here on earth. And um, to, to, to portray it any other way, in my opinion, has always been kind of tacky. And, and yeah. it, it doesn't help anybody. All no. it does is make them believe that there's a place they can achieve that's better than what humans are capable of. And yeah. that's not okay either. And we really didn't come here for that. I don't, I don't think that's why we, why we incarnated into this body. To, I mean, I think that we're here to experience as much as we can, you know, and I, there's many levels of perfection, but none of them are, um, you know, I think this, how would you know perfect if it was all you had? You know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to decipher it from anything. So I don't know if that's what we, you know, that's really the end goal because that's, I mean, maybe that's the end goal beyond this incarnation, but not here, you know. <laughs> that's something. Of, yeah. Speaking that's something Trev and Arnif always say is like, you come to Earth because you want limitation. You come to Earth because you want to experience going from a level of consciousness where you master yourself and then you go to master your heart, but still a mastery of your own you know, people can have their stuff together and be happy, and that's really mastering. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, um, the, the way that people think spiritual looks like and, and what it is, that's the stuff. The, you know, the, the showmanship, the fake spiritual, yeah. uh, look, uh, I'm perfect. I don't think bad thoughts. I don't have bad experiences. Rob, tell me, tell, and I, and I obviously, I, I, I know, but I, but I want, I want our listeners to, to know a little bit about Treb, you know, and, and, you know, I think there's a deep seated, like subconscious, like apprehension that humanity has about rep, reptile and reptilian, right? And so here you are, and you're talking about a benevolent hybrid reptilian species that is connected to humanity. And so you don't hear that every day. It's pretty unique. So Treb uh, himself is a reptilian human hybrid, which mixes an animal that's like a reptilian, which actually uh, it's from his own planet, but it, it would appear a lot like a Permian era um, reptilian mixed with a Komodo dragon. It's like the two closest animals I could think of that if they had a baby together, Treb's race original reptilian animal would look like. Then uh, the hybrid uh, human part comes from actual future version of humans who left Earth and uh, lived in the Beta Leporis system. Um, when moving to Beta Leporis, they ended up uh, living, and that small group of humanity uh, grew out into their own race that were called the Nihal. And they ended up creating Treb's race by mixing their own genetics with this reptilian animal. And after further understanding of it, it, it came because they understood that their past human selves had so much trauma with reptilians that humans needed the opportunity to interact with reptilians who were connected genetically and also who had a disposition of positivity versus negativity. The, the reason there's a lot of fear and a lot of bad information, and a lot of angst, and there's some accurate information too, mm -hmm. um, is because we've been traumatized by reptilians in our past as humans. We've also had, uh, because of that, and, and also the religion twisting and using their own terms to demonize uh, reptilian energy and all of the other things, it's created a form of galactic racism against reptilians mm -hmm. for humans. Um, so it's like the, the old people in the 1930s who uh, hated black people because they weren't white in the United States, just mm -hmm. instantly because my parents said so, because that's the thing, because we've had a uh, history that tells us we should feel or do this way. That's it. And yeah. 
and I'm not saying that people who hate reptilians are just bad people. I'm not saying that. I'm saying there's a reason you feel that way. The Anunnaki were the first race that came to the earth and changed the course of history forever by coming to the earth and changing human DNA the very first time. When they changed human DNA, we were like lower uh, at a level that was equal to or lower than Neanderthal or uh, our own past ancestors. So it was like pre-caveman. Yeah. Um, they took this animal, basically a second density monkey variety animal and mixed their own DNA with that and created humans. And there's a lot of controversy on why they created humans, but for the most part, it was to help them complete a task here on earth mm -hmm. that they didn't have the manpower to do. So they used the, some of the more intelligent versions of humans, mm -hmm. which is why there were different versions, Neanderthal, Homo sapien, and all the different other kinds, and created uh, a race uh, of working class yeah. slash slave race, basically. Right. And some of these, some of these entities were actually very bad and very nasty towards humans. Mm -hmm. Others treated humans with compassion. And this is the thing that I have just also come to realize because as much as I've channeled these entities, as long as I've channeled them, there still is something new that I learn all the time. And something new I've learned is that earth is the vibration of separation. I knew that, right? Mm -hmm. We've been talking about that today and I've talked about it a lot of times in other places. What I didn't know is that when entities come to earth and stay here long enough, they start becoming part of that vibration mm -hmm. too. So Anunnaki were originally also hybrids. Yeah. They had their own DNA that was Pleiadian, humanoid, you know, the blonde hair, blue eyed mm -hmm. Pleiadian beings and also had their DNA mix with Alpha Draconian, which are the bad guys. That's the one everyone fears and hates. Um, those are the six density, pretty malevolent style of reptilians. Those are the ones that have created trauma, well, <clears throat> co-created trauma, because it's not a one-way party, uh, co-created trauma throughout the galaxy through Orion Wars, all the way back. So this really, really uh, hardcore version of reptilian is half their DNA. So they have already got polarity going on in themselves, but they come to earth and it makes it more. They're not in this dimension. So in order to get these animals to physically interact with you, you have to split your consciousness, create an avatar and enter that part of your soul into the body. When you create the body, you have to create it with all the material from the planet. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it can't work on that planet. Yeah. So you're using carbon and uh, amino acids and all, all the stuff that creates life. Mm -hmm. And you're making that body. And when they break their soul up and enter that avatar with part of their consciousness, that body now is an earth being. Because the consciousness can be from anywhere. But when you're on earth, you're on earth. And that is what made their polarization even worse. <clears throat> so now you've got really nice, kind, loving, Anunnaki and really crappy ones who were just horrible and treated humans as glorified pets all the way to slaves and everything right. between. This is where our trauma comes from. And it wasn't just them and it wasn't just that time. Right. We've got the Elohim and then the Anunnaki come back uh, trying to make amends for, for the wrongs that they had done. Plus, we've been given reptilian DNA from Earth reptilians, right. which are also related to the draconian beings. Most reptilians are. They have some form of DNA from draconians mm -hmm. because draconians came to the galaxy to see how life of reptilian life here. Right. And, and so, when you say that, the, what, you, what, what I want to make the distinction of, and I want to make sure that I understand what you're saying, the 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 primates that were on this planet already had you know i mean like there's a reason why we end up with these terms like oh you know that was that that part is your lizard brain and you know like we have all these funny sayings that aren't so funny that come from a a, a very uh, deep seated place but w what you're saying i think is that we already had some reptilian DNA in in this primate in this mix of, of you know hodgepodge of genes that we had going on on the planet before the Anunnaki came 
and spice the DNA, right? Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, they're the first one that added it, but the second time they came back, uh, there had already been more added from other groups. Okay. Um, like the Earth reptilians, they they existed on Earth before humans did. Um, the dinosaurs were had just like the Anunnaki came here to Earth to splice genes and create hybrids for their own purpose. The Alpha Draconians did that on planets that had high populations of the archetype animal second density reptilian, because that's a natural archetype in the galaxy, natural archetype in the universe. And even though it's not extremely common, it's common enough where you can find planets filled with them, second density. So they found the dinosaurs and changed their DNA. And also, see, this is something I've been actually diving into really deeply lately because Kalina's been going through her own research and her own experiences. So they actually have been talking about this more with me because Kalina's been talking to me more about it. And what we found out, too, that during these wars that they've had uh, throughout the galaxy, that reptilians did... Uh, come to the dinosaurs in their early age, changed the DNA, and the other races didn't like that. They didn't like Alpha Draconians because they were malevolent and they were powerful and they were high density and had better technology than everyone because they didn't go back into the reincarnation cycle. They stayed physical. So they're the oldest living uh, entities in the galaxy. Hmm. And they didn't like that. They didn't like some you know, big bully coming around pushing. Yeah. So the the cataclysm that happened on Earth that killed the dinosaurs actually wasn't an accident. Right. It wasn't well, something no that happened. You know, but right. But I'm saying even if we take away knowing that souls manifest things mm -hmm. and and put on our normal human hat as an accident, you stub your toe or an asteroid hits the planet. Yeah. It wasn't. It was actual attack from another race of humanoids who didn't want reptilians being spread. Right. This is where the Earth reptilian trauma comes from. The mm -hmm. ones that survived had to move underground. They had to live through seeing their family die. They had to live through seeing the animal that spawned them into reality die. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, me and Kalina found out there was even like levels of cannibalism that had to occur for them to survive because oh, wow. the surface was so people give a bad rap to the earth reptilians well i don't know if i would be any better if i if i had to live through what they did and you're talking about the 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 uh un underground d societies that there's a there's a lot of lore and 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 talk about you know the scans that they do of, of the of quote middle earth and and how there's these huge cavernous re regions there's always been talk about how you know, some of the things that they've discovered when they started to dig these big underground bases were these vast tunnels and cities and that, you know, in, in fact, there's been this co-evolution happening with this other species. And in fact, more than one species, if I understand, you know, some of the um, some of what's been said about it. But I'm sure you have a lot more knowledge about it than, than I do. But that's what you're referring to, right? All right, the the reptilians specifically. I know that there are other races. I don't have a lot of knowledge about who they are, what they are, or why they're there, but I know that they're just like the uh, Earth reptilians. They're higher dimensional beings. So even if we went down into their little cavern, would we see them if we didn't have our psychic intuition uh, up there? It would look like a big empty room, right? Yeah. Because they're one dimension density higher, but they've always been close enough to humans those who are psychic can see them or they can project enough of their energy into the lower dimension for you to see them too. So that's, that's the reptilian. And there's a lot of hoo-ha about the reptilians that live on earth are the ones that control governments and all that. And yeah. some of that's got some small percentage of legitimacy, but most of it's just fear, fear porn that people yeah. use to get people riled up and scared or, or be labeled as conspiracy theorists and stuff. But these reptilians did teach early humans how to manipulate a system to create fear. They mm -hmm. didn't do it for themselves. In some ways, I guess, preservation. If humans are fighting with each other and not coming down here and looking or mm -hmm. messing with us, 
But another thing is they did have work with Alpha Draconians and that's Alpha Draconians big gig. That's why everyone hates them and they're always seen as horrible and malevolent. They, re they require fear as an energy from all planets that they connect their own selves to. Hmm. So on Earth, the more people that are disconnected from their source energy, the more energy that they're able to use to circumvent their incarnation cycle from happening. Oh. Because an incarnation cycle is finite, you know, you can extend it a little bit or shorten it a lot. <laughs> you know, there are races that die out in third density, fourth density all the time, and, and that's it. That's their incarnation cycle. But these guys have been going from galaxy to galaxy, matrix to matrix, dimension to dimension, finding new ways to circumvent what's already there. And they use it through technology and they use it on uh, 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 I, I, the, the best way I can explain it. It's like a biometric energetic field or force. Right. If we have fear, we have a, an emanating vibration of energy uh, in the ether, in our aura field. And if a whole planet does it's that. Like blood in the water for a shark. Right. And if a whole planet's got that, it's oozing. You know, Earth is oozing with fear and, and terror and hatred and all those really good energies that are helpful for their technology to use to circumvent their aging process and them having to go to the next. Because they understand the way that the universe works. They've been around longer than any of us in this galaxy have. They understand that if their race stops existing if they all died they're not coming back into new bodies they're not gonna they'd start to, back as reptilians go. right they've got to be they've got to start from square one just like we did here on earth just like the the first cone key and then the lumerians and lumanians atlanteans they have to start a whole new cycle not just a new life not just a new identity but a whole new cycle they don't want to start from scratch they love the position they're in, of power, of precedence, of control. And why would they want to give that up? So that's what they do. They use the system and they taught the earth reptilians. The earth reptilians taught certain humans who were pretty nasty too. Yeah. And that's why the system exists. And most people don't know that that's why the system exists as it is. Most people who are in power, who are creating this, don't even know. Right. <laughs> because they're just doing what they've been told to make money or to get power or to right. get votes or whatever they're doing. So, you know, and it's not like uh, Trebinard if always shared the reptilian thing. Uh, there are reptilians, the earth reptilians who have projected um, their own avatars into our reality. So there are reptilians that do exist around us, but it's not, it's not the David Icke everyone's uh, shape-shifting everyone's trying to eat you they don't eat babies in caves with does david someone... say that i don't i've never heard him say that. i like david Icke. i don't think no i don't I think, think he said mean, that but people yeah. who follow his work have said that or and that's what they say about him they yeah. they say that he says that in order to make everything else he says which make a lot of what he says is a little too honest for people you know that's their way of discrediting him i think sometimes is they make him sound crazy when if you listen to him he doesn't sound crazy he sounds pretty discerning and astute to me but you know with what yeah. he says um he's kind of he's kind of got things pretty pegged and the what he's doing is pointing out some of the people who on earth who have found ways and reasons to justify um you know re all the different reasons why the rest of society shouldn't live the way they're living and 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 i think that's one of the reasons why the the media is and a lot of people are manipulated to to think he's crazy so they'll dismiss what he says but uh i like david Icke, you know right no david Icke's good he the research he's done uh in the early days that's really all i'm familiar with i've heard him speak a few times about the situations that are happening on the yeah. earth today and i felt a lot of what he said had validity too um but these people who follow his work are take it to the 10th degree. Yeah. They're like, oh, not just shape-shifting reptilians or not just this or that, but, you know, they're dragging babies up. Someone actually said something to the effect of, uh, you know, Treb being an ancient technology robotic society of reptilians who died 
and their souls exist in technology so that they can eat babies and i'm i'm thinking about how many lines do you have to draw oh to get to that and why would someone who's not <laughs> physical and is a robot need to eat babies that doesn't make any sense <laughs> at all yeah no i, I don't know <laughs> i mean look I, I understand that what we're talking about is going to be unbelievable for a lot of people and sure and it's funny that the, and we go out for <laughs> slightly further out on a limb and then we're like oh no that's crazy talk <laughs> it's kind of ironic but um, no it's it's funny yeah it is, it is certainly <laughs> funny but but you know i also i have to remind myself that you know david ike went to peru i believe and he did ayahuasca and he had a, a this amazing like this crazy moment where he was kind of plugged into all that is here on earth and and was given this you know huge glimpse of of i think many many realities that are happening and that have happened on earth and so when i see people like david like who who know how important the heart is and know how immortal this makes us you know and who someone who's not afraid to lose reputation and life you know to speak their truth and knowing they're going to be ridiculed that takes a, a brave-hearted man who i have to respect you you also channel um a, another being who came to you i th i think well it was was it was treb who introduced you to this to this other being right can you talk a little bit about uh Ardith? Absolutely. So after uh, a while, after I had shared my channeling publicly, um, a guy came to me and said, hey, this is interesting. I, I want to see about writing a book with you. And I said, OK. And he said, here's some books I've done with other channelers. I'll, uh... <clears throat> so I looked through them and the guy was serious enough. And I was like, you know what? Fine, that's fine. I'll, I'll do some sessions with you. Uh, you can put it in the book if you want. Excuse me. And that's what we did. Um, Jefferson Biscardi, we did a book. Um, Which book? Uh, it was Benevolent uh, Reptilian Human Hybrids. This book? Right here? That's it. That's the one. That's <laughs> the a, one. It's a good book. I mean, it's Treb and family that make it great, but but it's a good, it's a good book. I'm glad you did it. Yeah, me too. Me too. And uh, Jefferson's a great guy too. Uh, and he's like, you know what, can we hear from these other entities? And before that, I never channeled anyone but Treb. So I was like, yeah, and probably and we'll talk to Treb, see what goes on. Um, and I asked Treb, I said, are there other entities that you can connect to? He said, yeah, sure. So I said, okay. Um, you know, and Treb, like away from the channeling and away from sharing that, me and Treb had always communicated. And he told me about this one being that he connected to where his relationship with him was the same as mine and his is, you know? Mm. So a higher dimensional being that you can connect with to get more information, another part of your own consciousness in an oversoul structure that can be a possible future version, all that stuff I didn't know, but I, I understood at that point there was a deep soul connection. So I was like, that's great. And he always called this entity Dnip Cygnus, uh, which was the name of a star and a constellation, uh, Dnip and Cygnus, the swan constellation. So I said, yeah, you know, a guy sounds great. Uh, the information he shared with Treb, Treb would share with me some stuff uh, like the IC1101 collective consciousness, um, some very similar paths that had been shared from humans to that galaxy far, far away. So it was a lot of really great, interesting stuff. And Trev said, uh, I can bring, you know, my own guide into this if you want. And Trev had always tried to share with me about how the reality works, dimensions, layers. Yeah. And I never could quite grasp a lot of it. <laughs> I, could, I was like, you know, that's, I understand there's higher levels. Great. So he brings in Ardiff and uh, that's, what this entity's name is Ardiff. He brings them in for the first time, 20 pages, the most intensive and best information out of the whole book in that 20 pages. Wow. Um, from the time, from what I understood about Treb and his race, and that was the only thing in the book I learned a lot about because 
it's now here in black and white in a way I can understand it. Mm -hmm. I listened to it a hundred thousand times. I absorbed it and it was great. So in a way, just everything continued as normal after the book was done and a while went past and Treb brought him forward to channel again. Mm -hmm. Now at this time I'm channeling Treb, Treb's channeling Ardiff mm -hmm. and that's how we're able to communicate through. So it's like a three-way game of phone tag. Mm -hmm. And it happened a few more times. And each time that Treb channel, the, the most amazing, and I said, you know, I'd really like to connect with them uh, myself and try to bring this information through. Uh, I'd also like him to be more regular in coming around and sharing information. So at that place, I was in, in a pretty rough place in my own life. I was uh, getting a divorce from my son's mother. Um, me and her past had grown quite a far apart. Um, the spiritual thing, the channeling, it all weirded her out a lot. And uh, she didn't care much <laughs> for it. Yeah. So yeah, it was just like too past diverting. And so that was pretty painful, pretty, pretty rough. Uh, uh, you know, after me and Kalina uh, started our relationship and started going in to move in together and spending more time together, she started helping me out with getting the channeling out there and putting together events and doing all this stuff that added some professionality to it and some more mainstream capacity to mm -hmm. the channeling to get it out to more people. And that's when Ardiff actually, we had been channeling Ardiff a few times through Treb on like the radio mm -hmm. shows and stuff and a couple of events, but he actually came forward himself during one of the connections where we were doing either my radio show or clean and said, I want to start working with you guys directly and more frequently. Hmm. And at that point I realized he had always wanted to do it. It was me that wasn't ready for it. Uh -huh. My spiritual growth, because when you channel every day, you're connecting to bigger parts of yourself each right. day. And you're also connecting to more consciousness. And when I was in that really bad stage back then, and this really great stage, then that was my growth. So he connected and uh, put us together with a artist who is a sixth density where Treb's a fifth density reptilian human hybrid. He would be a sixth density humanoid. And I say humanoid because he's not human, human. Um, you know, what's the uh, difference for people who, for for people who are listening, you know, between a human and humanoid, and also a sixth density and a fifth density being? Sure. Let's start with the human humanoid. Humans look like us, like the Pleiadian humans. They, they if they drop down here, you might say, "Wow, they have you know perfect yeah. facial structure, or they have beautiful bigger eyes," or but you, they could come down here and, and fit in with you, you know. Mm -hmm. A humanoid is a bipedaled entity that could never fit into the human as a human, but has human features. Mm. Like even reptilians, that's a humanoid. Uh, Trips a reptilian humanoid because mm. even though he has reptilian scales and teeth and tail and claws. He's bipedal. Right, right. he's bipedal, but he also has human features. He's got a face, all that stuff. Mm. Um, so that's part of it. But when I say humanoid, usually I use the term of entities that don't fit in one of those predetermined classifications. Like we've got reptilians, we've got amphibians, we've got uh, insectoids, avians, canines, felines. Mm -hmm. We have archetypes, but Ardiff doesn't really fit into any of those. So I call him a humanoid because he's bipedal human looking, but not actually like human like their feet are completely different their hands he's very short uh large eyes that are purple long hair that's purple um he doesn't so, really so fit some of the some of the the stereotypical um allegory and and kind of illustration that we've seen of you know um aliens i hate that word but we've seen of extraterrestrials on on earth you know and like you know you, if you heard about the crash at roswell you heard about like the, the beings that were in those uh um s spacecraft were very short in fact one of the one of the people who retrieved them when he first walked up he, and this is this dude's like as old and as genuine as they come you know in this interview you hear him talking he's like i thought it, he said i thought it was a kid. I thought it was a kid when I first walked up because it was such a small 
and then I realized it wasn't a, it wasn't a kid. You know, that would that be considered a, a humanoid? Yeah, grays grays are are like humanoids or yeah. beings that are are grayish. Even though I kind of classify them as grays, but they're yeah, they're very humanoid. They don't fit really in in another archetypal energy, mm-hmm. but they're directly related to, to kind of. Um, well, depending on what kind of gray, but the gray yeah. archetype is related to the human archetype, which is uh, very similar. Yeah. Even mm-hmm. though there are different amounts of fingers that some of the grays can have. And the grays is actually kind of an archetype itself too, because there's tall whites, there's short grays, there's medium grays. There's tons of entities who have an archetypal physical structure that manifests out that look similar to each other. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so Artif was, and I've been, I've been curious about this ever, ever since I, I learned about it, but what, you know, you had such a visual experience when you met Treb, like when you, when you encountered Artif, were you able to, I mean, was it a similar, was the, the visual vivid, like, like when you met Treb or was, was it something that you came to, um, see and understand you know, as you went. Yeah, uh, with Artif, it was never like that because when I first started connecting to him, Treb was connecting me to him. Right. So I was still going through Treb. And even to this day, I've seen what Artif looks like. I've seen visualizations of him. I've seen when I'm communicating with him, when I'm with Treb, I can see like a projected vision of him. I see. Okay. Uh, Treb's shown me what he looks like in that same projected vision and it matches the way I received him. So oh. I don't do physical interactions face to face with him like I do Treb. But that's also because he's sixth density, which brings oh, me back to your original question, yeah. the difference between fifth and sixth. So a density is different than a dimension because a, a dimension is a physical level of vibration. So we have our dimension, which is fourth dimension, which is time mm-hmm. and space is one and height, depth and width as the other three. So that's four. And in the next dimension would be less physical beings and also without time and space, the Fifth same dimension, right? as ours, right? It's fluid. So that's a difference in a dimension, but in a density, a density encompasses a part of the evolution that the soul goes through. So it's a journey of the soul. Souls go in a very specific pattern of journey, even though they all do it differently and the groups of consciousness and the individual consciousnesses do it way differently. Um, it's all similar. You go through the stage of physicality, which is first density, the elemental consciousness, rocks, fire, electricity, stuff like that. And then the second density where life begins in the human uh, mind and the human thought process, we say, well, this thing is an amoeba. This is a bacteria that they're alive. Look, they're moving. So that's where the second density starts, but it goes all the way to the most complex um, plant and animal life, uh, bacterial, viral, all of those. And then the third density is where humans have been for, for their whole history since the Anunnaki's first test subject from that point forward, humans on the third density. And then fourth density, uh, well, let's back up. What's the reason for those first three? It's a soul journey, right? Well, I'm not really explaining the soul journey. So to be physical is is a simple existence. You just exist. You experience through existence. The second density you're experiencing through existence and instinct. Animals are smart. Animals can uh, calculate. They have emotions. They have thoughts. But they experience most of their experience through instinct the more complex versions are closer to the third density. They're the ones that experience uh, more than just instinct. Mm -hmm. The animals that have been around humans most have connected with that energy. So they understand it like dogs and cats and dolphins and whales and, you know, monkeys and, and all the ones that have been relatively close. So they're showing more aspects of third density, but they're still mostly instinctual then humans come to the self expiration. This is where we understand ourselves more than just our existence. This is where complex thoughts come in. This is where 
understanding of linear time comes in. A cat doesn't say four days ago, <laughs> um, you know, a bird pecked at me. It just knows it might have a visual memory, but mostly it's a held trauma in the yeah. body, right? It's, it's an instinctual yeah. thing where the animal attacked me before. So I'm going to remember that in my body through that's reflexes. Right. right. And so the human, that's, that's the jump there, but mostly in these three steps, you can correlate each step with a chakra system. The first, what's the first chakra? It's experiencing. It's where you're at, your, your sense of safety, your sense of environment. It's existing. And the second chakra is sexuality, reproducing, um, but also instinct, right? It's instinctual to sexually reproduce and masculine and feminine energy. It's all very instinctual. The third density, uh, third chakra is self-exploration, also linear time. So perfect fit. Mm -hmm. Fourth density and at first one through three, they're all in the same dimension. Okay. And then the fourth density is another dimension, but the soul now starts going through the connection process. Mm -hmm. So it goes through the exploration of the heart, the exploration of connection to all things. So your relationships, your uh, relationship with your computer, your dog, your cat, love, um, yeah, love. Wow. love. Yeah. Your thoughts, your yeah. job, everything. Um, so it's a connection place. Then fifth density, same with the fifth chakra. It's about expressing from what's in the heart, but also where wisdom exists. So the exploration of wisdom and the sixth density is the last physical density. And that's where love and wisdom combine for a sense of overall mastery a sense of psychic intuition a psycho uh, third inner eye. sight yeah third eye absolutely so all of that so it it correlates but it's also its own journey and the reason i i, I was explaining that uh, where artists at so far up where i'm at so far down trep comes quite a ways down to see me when i when me and him are meeting even though i'm at his planet and see his surroundings, I'm barely getting to that bottom rung. He's at the end of his rim, so he's got to come down quite a ways at the bottom of his so I can meet with him. Artif's way higher than that. I don't think Artif cares to come down. Uh, Trev and Artif have different personalities, right? They have different ways of seeing things. Trev loves to connect with everybody. He's like, oh my God, there's nothing I could do <laughs> more exciting. Yeah. Exactly. He's like, uh, I want to connect to everything. So he'll have 30 conversations going on at once. He'll be at, on his planet with his family, with friends, with another planet on a ship. Doesn't matter. He could be connecting with 30 people who are thinking about him from any part of the galaxy or connecting with him in channel state. Artif does one thing at one time. He's only focused at that experience so he can put all of himself in that experience. Mm -hmm. So drastically different. I don't think Artif wants to come down. I think he wants to stay where he is and, and give us the part of him that he can give to, mm -hmm. to have the experience of channeling. So that's, it's, you know, it's remarkable people. It's, I think when you first hear it, it's a bit uh, hard to imagine because we are so focused locally and, and, you know, and we, and we imagine that our consciousness is, is totally individualized, but yet, you know, I know that, you begin to have experiences that are good indicators that and reminders that you're not exactly always individualized as a consciousness you know if you've ever had a psychic experience like i have an identical twin so you know i i've um i've, I've always had this slight division in consciousness because i've always had this you know connect deep connection with my my twin brother we were literally one egg that split and the two, you know, so we were connected in every way. And, and I feel like it's, you know, you, you kind of, you know what your bro's thinking, you know, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to see him to, to know. And, and so I've had this experience of my, you know, that's kind of a division of, con of consciousness. I'm not just here, but I'm, but I'm also aware of what's going on there, you know, and people talk about near death experiences where, you know, they found their consciousness above their body in two rooms at once, you know, in two rooms at once. And then again, you know, in, with another relative. And then all of a sudden they're like, I, so I was here 
and I was with my mother and I and all of a sudden there were three places you know the moment they leave this physical plane and I feel like this happens to us sometimes you know when we're when we're dreaming it's just that we don't and usually can't remember it <laughs> most people who have had deep meditations or astral projections or, or vivid dream remembering really have a hard time identifying with that so if you think on it on the smallest level I always uh, would use the example of multitasking, mm -hmm. even though that sounds very small and dumb comparison, it's actually very similar because think about when you're sitting down on a phone call with a family member and you're also, you know, signing a check or writing a kid's note for school. Mm -hmm. And you're also, you know, directing your animals to get out of under your feet. And you're also, you know, listening to the weather because it might storm tomorrow. You know, some people are better at that than others, but you can imagine each piece of attention that you've given to all those things at one time. That's how Trebs works with his consciousness. He's giving whole chunks of himself to this entire conversation and channeling while he's got other chunks doing the same thing. And then his whole focus of his physical body is doing something entirely different. Um, and it's hard, it's hard to understand that at the level that you were talking about, because I don't think most people uh, either have had that experience yeah. fully or can remember that. But a lot of people who I've heard who have had that were exactly, like you said, a, a near-death experiences yeah. Yeah, or dream states. Yeah. It's a rare, but, but you're right. To simplify it, it would be. And I and I feel like that this is our um, tra trajectory as humans. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, eventually we will get to a place where you know we we are able to multitask in a in a way or or have this expanded consciousness that is enough to do what what Treb does. I feel like it's in it's it's in our our future and and that it, you know our our DNA and all of its. Com compact and you know and all the unfolding that it has to do yet in our evolution that that's got to be in there somewhere it just feels that's what my intuition tells me i i agree a hundred percent i don't think that humans unless you know we are one of the ones then that, that decides we're done with our incarnation cycle and kills ourselves off before we get there yeah. um i think that's it but i don't think humans have that i think that's what this whole world craziness is now and what our whole path has been i think that's the manifestation and results of all the different dnas that we have in us the conflicting pleiadian and reptilian just those two alone can fight itself yeah. um all the different tweaks i think that's the actual cause of that but i think we're getting out of our system because i think as a race into fourth density as we start we're, we're going to show all those layers of, mm. of mystery and truth that needs to be shown. Yeah. Um, and I think that that leads to unison because if everyone sees that they're getting manipulated or hurt or played around with by people, um, it, that, that brings people together by itself. But even if that doesn't occur, just the showing of what's underneath the rug, you know, yeah. um, that's what's been happening. That's why our politics is crazy. That's why the COVID thing has been crazy. And people have been showing what's underneath the I systems know. that have failed us from the medical and school and all of that stuff. So yeah, the yeah. beautiful thing is I had foresight, not last year, but this year, 2021, mm -hmm. I had foresight of that a long time ago when Trev first explained to me you know what shifting into that new density looks like ascension some people call it uh that was a big thing for me because i was like wow we get to evolve you know mm. and he said 2012 is like the the point in the middle of the cycle and nine years on both sides mm. and i'm like nine years that's gonna be that was 2003 to 2021 and I didn't think about it until 2020 started. I was wow. like, now I get it. Because yeah. the whole cycle is meant to shift you from your end of third density to the beginning of fourth. How can we... And something artist said beautifully. Um, he said, this is where you pressure test the systems in order to see where the holes in the boat are mm. so that you're able to address the individual 
and collective issues that have been experienced through your whole life that everyone's just pretended was normal and everyone knew wasn't the you know the school systems the education systems the hospital system the religious systems the government systems all of it i wanted to ask you you know if you one of the things that you've learned in your in your channeling and and being in touch with these beings and and the books that you've written and you know there's you you start to gather a, a lot of information about the structure of a society and and learn about the structure of sentient beings and, and all the ways that that lives and livelihoods can manifest you know in on a in a society on a planet and and you start to imagine a different a different way an easier way you know to to, to do things and structure things and you know i thought if you were going to if you could speak to the people on on this planet you know and, and have them understand something or help them understand something you know and and in what what would be the 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 thing that you would whisper in their ear that that you know if they understood would greatly enhance their their lives on this planet and the lives of their loved ones I, I, there's so many things i, I would want to share but what you touched on just a second ago is probably one of the biggest things the the ability for me to see on both sides of the coin comes from me spending time with trev and people on this planet um their race is a do what you want to do uh you know in any way shape or fashion if you're not affecting or interfering with the free will of another do what you want to do you know what i mean that's their whole race they live like that and their lack of expectations and focus only on excitement is a beautiful model for how everyone can be happy when the politics pops up um I can, I've spent time, I have friends who are far, far right conservative, conservatives, far, far left liberals, and I've got friends in both, and I've listened to what they say. I feel the emotion behind the way they're saying it, how they're saying it. And I respect, because even if I don't agree with them, or even if I don't feel the same way, or even if I can't understand the passion behind the ideologies that they have, I can understand how they got to that point, how they got to that understanding. And it's an acceptance for other people's experience because who am I to tell anyone what they should or shouldn't do in their life? Who am I to tell how you should or shouldn't look at things in their own life? Uh, if, if I had listened to that type of mindset, I would have never been able to explore my gift. I would have never been able to connect with Trevor. By some miracle, if I did, I would have never been allowed to perceive it as a reality and follow through with it. Because people just said, listen, you're crazy. Listen, this isn't real. Listen, you need to get help. Listen, this, listen, that. And if the expiration of each person goes into their focus without expectations, but with just excitement and living in that moment, literally that's the only recipe for happiness and i don't have it mastered i'm a human i like to live in the past sometimes i like to project myself into the future a lot <laughs> um I, I have lots of expectation but the times when i'm able to do it when i'm able to to literally try to be as energetically centric as i can and as much as i try to be neutral in my perspectives even if just for assessing it, even if I pick a side or pick a thought or pick an idea, um, even when I assess that thought or idea, try to not lock into my own personal experiences from the past that might jade it. Um, that's when I really find the gold inside. That's when I really find the past of least resistance for me. And that's where I find the beauty of most people. If I if I sit there and just locked into one side on, on politics and said, oh, my God, how how can this other side feel and think and be that way? I would have lost a lot of friends. 
Um, I will, I've lost friends who chucked me out because I spoke down the middle mm-hmm. and, you know, fence sitter and, you know, pick a side type yeah. thing. And I'm like, listen, you know, d- does your feelings about how right this is negate the feelings of someone how wrong or vice versa? No, yeah. because you both arrive to it through your personal experience and understand. Mm-hmm. So live and let live. If someone's not trying to stop you from doing what you want to do if someone's not trying to hurt or harm another person you know let them have their excitement in whatever shape form and way that takes and if we all practice that we would have a better world instantly mm-hmm. instantly a 50 percent increase of everyone's life uh happiness um health yeah. uh, mental state all so that would be the big thing the, the other thing is learn how you create those things in front of you too um creation of of everything tends to be something that people think is a figurative term well if i think better i create better i I have a better reality because i'm seeing what's already there is better yes that's true but also creation from a very literal point and that's a subject that we could go hours on by itself but just thinking about these types of things with an open mind and even if you choose to take a part of that reality and say, you know what, it's not for me, that's wonderful too. Because at least you've been exposed to something that you can say, I've looked at, I've thought about, and I don't think that's right for me. And that's also a helpful and good thing for you because you know where you stand now. Yeah. So it's all good. <laughs> it is, it, it, it is all good. And you know, it can be uncomfortable and that's where people get a little, you know, there's a difference between uncomfortable and something that is unfamiliar and something that you you don't like you know the moment we become uncomfortable or we start to see things that are uncomfortable or we start to hear things that you know the brakes kind of are conditioned to get pumped you know and meanwhile you're not in danger you're just you're 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 just coming up against something that is doesn't jive with your core understanding of reality but that doesn't mean that you can't discern it see it and decide whether it's something that you want to consider or not. You know, I think people feel like they become unmoored the moment they come up against, you know, a belief system that is not aligned with their own. And they feel like somehow on the other side of that, if they if they were to end up there, they would be lost. You know, there's this like this the great unknown it can be scary, um, but it's a habit. It's a conditioned scariness because you start to realize the more you are willing to go past that uncomfortableness and go past the fear and surrender into the moment, whatever you're doing and, and realize that on the other side of it is just you. It's always just you. It may not be exactly the you that went in, but it's still part of you and your evolution. I think that there's a great revelation for people who are brave enough to to just say, eh, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, this may not be comfortable, but I'm going to listen to it. I'm going to consider it, you know, and so it's a great point you made. And uh, I'm so grateful for your time, Rob, and I'm grateful we finally got a chance to talk, man. I am so, so grateful for it too, brother, and I'm so happy I had a chance to come on and chat with you. We definitely should do this again whenever the time is right and you're excited for it. I'm, I'm always excited to chat with you. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I wish you and, and, and your family the best. Give my best to your wife. Tell her I said thank you so much for letting me have you for two hours. And uh, <laughs> and, your, and wife. your wife too, please. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first thing I'm going to do is tell her. Uh, man, but we'll have to do it again soon, man. And, I, and I'll be in touch for sure. That uh, sounds great. Thank you so much. And all my love to your family too and everyone who who took the time to make it to this uh, end of the video. Thank you guys for listening. Yeah, indeed. Thank you. Thanks, bro. We'll talk soon. Thank you, brother. Peace, bye.